Welcome everyone and thank you so much for taking the time to be here and engage in what I know will be a really interesting and thought-provoking series of events um, that we're running here for International Women's Day at the University of Aberdeen. It's a huge privilege for me to welcome Anna to be part of the University's International Women's Day celebrations. This is the University of Aberdeen's eighth gathering to celebrate International Women's Day, but it is our first virtual programme of events. And while I love the usual buzz and excitement of our in-person event, one of the real benefits of the format this week is that we're able to open it up much more widely. And we've got over 300 registrations from a whole host of countries across the world. So welcome and thank you for taking part. The commitment to be inclusive is at the heart of the University of Aberdeen and we set out this commitment in our vision to guide our 20 year plan over the next 20 years, Aberdeen 2040. The events and the conversations that will start through our International Women's Day celebrations are crucial as we look to consider the tangible actions that we can take to support a more gender equal world. We all have a role to play to call out gender bias and inequality and to celebrate and support the potential of women everywhere. How do we raise our game and lead the way? International Women's Day is much more than a single day of celebration. It's an opportunity to be part of a global conversation, to reflect, to discuss, question, challenge, inspire, lead, develop, support and to influence. As a university, this year's global campaign theme, Choose to Challenge, really resonates. It is in the DNA of our university to challenge. Our founder, Bishop Elphinstone, set down that as a university, we should be dedicated to the pursuit of truth. And today, that means that we work to challenge the understanding of global issues through our research, but also through our education as we support our students and our graduates to feel empowered, to challenge through their learning. If we can plant a seed of curiosity and challenge in each of you, and that empowers you to take the discussion to someone else, that is how change will start to happen. COVID-19 has brought many of the issues faced by women into sharp focus. You will have seen the newspaper headlines as many experts warn that the COVID-19 crisis could set women back de decades. Research indicates that jobs done by women are more vulnerable um, to the COVID-19 pandemic as a higher proportion of women work in the sectors that have been most impacted. In addition to this, the virus has significantly increased the burden of unpaid care, which we know disproportionately is carried by women. We need to proactively understand the gender implications of the pandemic. What does this mean for each and every one of us as we encourage ourselves individually and collectively to question the status quo, forcing our policymakers to do more and our universities and our companies to lead by example? For me, International Women's Day every year encourages a little bit of personal reflection. I'm here and in the very privileged position that I'm in now for a range of reasons, but there are two that I wanted to highlight in particular. I have been able to stay in the workforce when my children were small, and they're still pretty small, um, they're eight and ten. It has been and it continues to be really challenging, but my employer, the University of Aberdeen, has showed a willingness to be flexible in their approach to my work and how I deliver my responsibilities. I feel like I've been lucky, but it shouldn't be about luck and I shouldn't feel grateful as if I'm one of the lucky ones. We need to do more on this and embed it into the thinking of organisations so that we can develop and retain really talented women. And I'm excited to hear more about this from Anna shortly. I also have to recognise the role played by those around me and those who have gone before me who have chosen to challenge. While we are delighted to celebrate the achievements of inspirational figures, Today is a celebration of all women who have pushed the glass ceiling and challenged gender imbalance to make their own contributions to, um, to equality. I'm here today because of the cheerleaders I have around me who have celebrated my success, picked me up when things haven't quite gone according to plan and encouraged me to believe in myself and have confidence. I would encourage you all to please champion, you, um, champion those around you and to celebrate the achievements of the women and girls in your life. 
I cannot overstate the value of to have someone that you respect and admire or trust hearing you, believing in you and recognizing the potential that you have. Before I go on to introduce our speaker, I wanted to go over some general housekeeping um, and just the event running order. We'll have about 25 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So please do use the Q&A function. Please put in questions there as they come to your mind and we'll get to as many questions as we can throughout the sessions. Feel free to use the general chat function for comments that you might have throughout the event or even just say hi to each other. Please remember when referring or uh, retweeting or referring to the event to use the hashtags that we highlighted earlier and we'll put those back up at the end. I would now like to introduce our wonderful speaker for today, Anna Whitehouse. Anna, a journalist and editor who has written for The Telegraph, Independent, Stylist, Marie Claire, and was once edit uh, vice editor of uh, Time Out Amsterdam. Anna is a columnist for Grazia, hosts her own Sunday night show on Heart Radio, and through Flex Appeal, her campaign for more flexible working for all workers has been quoted in Parliament, featured on national television, and jumped around UK town centres um, with lycra-clad uh, flash mobs. She launched the website uh, Mother Pucka in 2015, which is a portal for news, events, reviews, and honest comment for people who happen to be parents. With husband Matt, she's co-authored two best-selling non-fiction books, Parenting the Shit Out of Life and Where's My Happy Ending. Their debut novel, Underbelly, is due out in August this year. I'm absolutely delighted that Anna has joined us today and without further ado, I will hand over to Anna. Anna. Thanks so much, Jenny. Uh, can you do my PR in the future, please? <laughs> I quite fancy that. Um, thank you for joining us today on International Women's Day. Um, I want to start with a glimmer of hope. Uh, on Friday, Liz Truss, the Minister for Women and Equalities, called for flexible working to be normalised. It's on the government website, it's in black and white. It is a start, but we're out of the starting block. So um, thanks Liz for choosing to challenge. Um, I mean, it is her job, but uh, I think where I want to begin is where Flex Appeal uh, began. And it began in a very human place. Um, it was sparked by a quote from uh, the author Douglas Copeland. And I read it in The Guardian and it said, the nine to five is barbaric. I truly believe we will look back on the nine to five like we do child slavery in the 18th century. Uh, that is a punchy quote, uh, but I remember it being almost the point that pushed me over into launching this campaign. Uh, and what had predated that moment were three factors. One, I was training to be a barrister, age 21, and I remember looking around the room at Devereux Chambers on Chancery Lane, and I couldn't see women beyond 30. There were lots of men, and I started questioning where the women were, and I realised it was because they hit a wall of caring responsibilities, having children. And it was at that point, age 21, I was a 21 year old woman, I stepped back from a career to step into a career of journalism because I could simply see flexibility. I could see I could be a freelance journalist around having a family. So that was the first point. The second point was I'm half Dutch and I moved to Amsterdam uh, when I was 29. And uh, I lived there for five years. It took me two years to stop thinking that they were slackers. They simply left work at 5 p.m. on time. And I remember thinking they weren't committed to their jobs. I remember thinking they didn't care. It took me two years to see that actually I had it wrong, that I had to unlearn so much sort of learned behavior from the UK uh, and to actually break down why I thought they weren't in fact good at their jobs simply because they weren't strapped to their rickety office chair under a strip light uh, doing sort of a game of competitive sitting, uh, which is what I actually saw when I came back to London, we were in fact doing. It seemed that managers in the UK, businesses in the UK were less concerned about what we were doing, but where we were sitting. Um, so that was the third point. I came back to the UK and I started working for the L'Oreal Group. Um, I didn't leave because I wasn't worth it. Their mascara is great, we're on very good terms, but I simply was coming back from work one day and a gentleman got his briefcase trapped in the train door. 
and it put me 11 minutes late for nursery pickup. I was then charged one pound a minute and sat on one of those tiny primary colored chairs meant for an infant and sort of told off by my daughter's key worker. And I remember in that moment thinking, this isn't working. This isn't my fault, this is systemic. Um, and I thought I need flexibility here to make this work. So I put my flexible working request in. I asked to come in 15 minutes earlier and leave the office 15 minutes earlier. And it was rejected on the grounds that it would open the floodgates to others seeking flexible working. And that was the point where I launched Flex Appeal and quit my job because I wanted to ask, why can't we open these floodgates? What is the fear? And I then started looking into it uh, without a job, had lots of time to Google. And I found astounding stacks of stats highlighting the connection between empowering and trusting your workforce to work flexibly and making hard, cold cash. And this is uh, one example is Pursuit Marketing in Glasgow. They simply sat there, 150 strong workforce down and looked them in the eye and said, what do you need to do a better job for us? And what came off that was they wanted to work a four day week on the same amount of money. So one less day, same amount of cash. They said, right, we'll trial this for a three month period. This extended to two years because it worked so well. Productivity went up within that organization 30%. They doubled their turnover to 5 million in two years. This isn't just uh, an exhausted mum saying, please, you know, can I see a little bit more of my Weetabix smattered child? This is about cold hard cash. Another example was um, Robert Reetbrook in uh, New Zealand, PepsiCo in New Zealand. He looked at how his uh, workforce were working and what they needed. And a lot of them just said, I don't want to feel the shame about leaving work on time. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Somebody just simply wanted to leave the office on time. So he implemented, uh, for, at no cost, a leaving loudly policy where you own leaving the office. Uh, he would have people saying, I'm off to pick up my child from nursery, or you know, I'm off to have a beer and a burger at Weatherspoons. It's not about parents, it's about people. Um, and he empowered his people in that one moment to leave the office. Um, but yeah, I think the other side of it as well is it doesn't have to simply about, be about the people. Uh, BT, for example, released their footprint across the UK. They made global savings of 100 million in one year simply by having a HQ and saying to their staff, well, you can work anywhere and everywhere, but you know, if you wanna come in for meetings, this is where it's at. But by relinquishing that footprint, they pulled in more money. So I started putting this together. I was like, okay, why are we not putting humans above business, really focus on what's good for that employee, but for business benefit? Uh, focus on what the employer can get out of this. Uh, and to be really frank, flexible working has been working for years, but it's been one way traffic from employee to employer. We do 468 hours average unpaid overtime a year. So yeah, flexible working has been working fine towards uh, the employer, but I am here and Flex Appeal is here to address that imbalance and to question a structure that was launched in the industrial revolution. The nine to five was from the industrial revolution. We have moved on so much from that point. And I want anybody watching right now to think about a moment that you were at work, going to work and you had to be in at 9 a.m. That was fixed. Anyone who was in, let's say 8.59 a.m. was a good employee. Anybody got there past 9 a.m., let's say 9.02 a.m., bad employee, regardless of leaves on the line, regardless of traffic, regardless of a child screaming for their mother being dropped off at nursery, regardless of all these human and physical factors that can mean that you are two minutes late for work. We were already setting our employees up for a fall at that point where 
good employee gets in before nine, bad employee gets in after nine. So we're literally looking to break that down. And uh, up until the 23rd of March, 2020, I had kickback across the board, public sector, private sector saying, yeah, well, you know, I know it's working there, but it can't work for us. It's impossible for us. Uh, the pandemic hit and uh, seemingly overnight within a 48 hour period, it was indeed possible. Uh, and I'm not saying that working from home and flexible working are the same thing. Being strapped to your kitchen desk is no different to being strapped to the office. But ultimately, those companies that were pushing back uh, had to log on and zoom in. Otherwise, they would have to shut down. And it's interesting to see what is, in fact, possible when cold, hard cash is at stake. And I also just want you to think at this point, uh, I heard from a lot of people living with disabilities within that period saying they had weeks prior to this been rejected from a job that needed to be in the office. And they were said, you can't, you can't take on this job, unfortunately, because we will need you here nine to five, five days a week. And seemingly overnight, uh, these companies then had to enable their workforce to work remotely. So what is that saying to those living with disabilities? It's saying the company simply didn't want them. And I think that's what we're really looking at here is centering humans at the heart of business, trying to find a more humane, human way of operating. Now, it was at this point that uh, I, along with Sir Robert McAlpine, decided to dig deep on what we can learn from this pandemic so that we can wield it to our advantage post pandemic. We uh, did a report called Flex Forever, Flexible Working Beyond a Crisis. And this really looked at the crunch points for, uh, just looked at the crunch points for employers. Like where were their, what were their fears of opening the floodgates? And we had lots of examples come through. We interviewed 1,420 businesses. Um, one of those was Talk Talk. Now their whole focus was in uh, rebranding flexible working. Because at the moment, if I say flexible working to an exhausted uh, manager right now, they see it as another thing on a list of things to do. And they're like, OK, yeah, I'll get to that once I've tried to keep my business afloat. But what TalkTalk Talk did was they rebranded it as next generation working. Uh, this is about talent. This is about retaining talent. And I come back to where I started a 21 year old woman who decided not to pursue a career as a barrister because she could see a brick wall in front of her. Uh, this is all about talent. And so they repackaged flexible working as ret retaining talent. Why do you not want the best people to work for you wherever they are? And uh, like I said, it's not about competitive sitting. I don't care where you work as long as you do your job. Um, they also moved to core hours. So they did 10 to three. So a lot of uh, people I speak to at the moment are saying, I don't want to work from home anymore. I am done with my four walls. Uh, but I think people want to have an element of office space, but also the freedom to work where they want. So they had core hours where people would cross over. You would have the, the dreaded water cooler chats, which I think everybody right now is desperate for. Who knew? Um, and you would have a little bit of the best of both worlds, I suppose. So Talk Talk was a very good example, I think, of how how we can move forward. And if anybody here wants to empower their own HR department, you just need to look on the Motherpucker website under Flex and our Flex Forever report is there. It's a 20 page report, it's in depth. 71% of employers interviewed were wanting to push flexible working forward, but didn't know how to. So this is really your how. We know the why, but our Flex Forever report is the how. It's almost top trump cards of businesses, private, public sector, across the board. You can pick one from there and go, oh, well, they've done it this way. It's basically giving you the information you need to ensure that flexible working does work post pandemic. I think what we need to come to at this point, uh, which is where Flex Appeal has turned, is the impact the pandemic has had on women. 
Um, now, I think one thing we can see from SARS and Ebola, the embers of those pandemics, is that gender inequality widens at a terrifying rate. At this point, uh, I am having visions of waking up in a Margaret Atwood novel. Um, you know, I think we can see that 47% of mothers have stepped down and quit or have been made redundant compared to fathers in lockdown. Women have been 1.8 times more likely to lose their jobs than men in lockdown, uh, because for all the International Women's Day sellotape together, you cannot deny when you're in a household and you look at whose job is more important financially, because of gender pay gap, because of equal pay, it's a man's job. Uh, and this is not a man bashing exercise, it's a statement of fact. So women have just been stepping back from careers that they fought hammer and tong for uh, in the pandemic. And uh, it's, it's galling, it's nothing short of galling, it's terrifying. And you throw in gender pay gap reporting being scrapped in 2020, not just extended the deadline, suspended. A whole year of reporting at the time when we needed that transparency, just gone. And we have been campaigning for gender pay gap reporting to come back. And it has been reinstated with a delay for 2021. But why is transparency at this point meant to feel like a win? Um, and I think anybody watching right now, this is not simply for, ideally, it's something that lobbyists, uh, campaigners that the government will fix, but we need to be having these conversations in our own homes. Um, we need to be questioning why furlough wasn't split between uh, a man and a woman within a home. Why was it assumed that a man's job would take precedence? Yes, finance is essential, but also so are careers, so is equality. It's not a nice to have. Um, so I think, you know, it can be seen as something, oh, that equality is being dealt with out there, but actually we need to bring it back indoors. Um, and anybody who saw the government's uh, stay home, save lives uh, advert that was being touted in the middle of um, lockdown three, it had uh, three houses, a fourth house here. Within the three houses were women ironing, women and girls, ironing, cleaning, cooking, homeschooling. And on the left, in one house, you just had a man, Netflix and chilling. And I think if that's the blueprint from the government, you can see where we sit right now, why this isn't something to be swept off the table or like we had with gender pay gap reporting in 2020 to be suspended. This equality is it's a privilege if you're within government going, you know what, we'll just park that for now. It's not something to be parked. Um, so I think that sort of <laughs> takes me on to my own personal experience of the pandemic. And I don't know about you, but uh, I kept seeing memes of Sir Isaac Newton in the bubonic plague uh, coming up with a theory of calculus and gravity. And uh, I remember looking at him and everyone was touting him as this bastion of productivity. Uh, and I was like, wait a sec, he hasn't got a child hollering for a pepper pig spoon over a Paw Patrol spoon. Uh, I, the, this is not our blueprint for how this works. You know, productivity should not be measured right now in a pandemic. We are not working from home. We are in our homes working in a crisis um, with child rearing, with stress, with strain, with anxiety, um, so many layers. And I did the very rough maths on it and parents uh, were being expected at the beginning of lockdown three and lockdown two to do roughly sort of eight hour working day, three hours of homeschooling with 12 hours of wraparound childcare that is uh, approximately what 23 hours in a 24 hour day that's one hour for sleeping and eating um and it was at this point that i uh, linked up with the trades union congress uh, because i was like it's very very clear that there is nobody at the top there's nobody in government who understands the situation on the ground, uh, that women are burning out. I was hearing daily from women logging off from their careers because they simply could not hold that together. And it was women, for, like I said earlier, for all the International Women's Days, the burden of childcare is still, still strapped firmly to female shoulders. Um, 
So we linked up with the Trade Union Congress and to give you some context to the desperation that sits within the pandemic right now amongst women, they usually get around 2,000 responses to their surveys. We had 55,638 responses, all from women. Not one man responded. Um, and I think that gives some sense of where we sit right now in a world where gender pay gap reporting in 2020 was scrapped, in a world where the burden of childcare sits very, very heavily on female shoulders. But moving towards the future, the Flex Forever report, everything we have learned, everything we hope to wield to our advantage, to some extent, repair the damage uh, in the embers of coronavirus. Um, my flexible working utopia is a world where we ebb and flow between work and office with trust at the core of it, uh, where we have managers like at Accenture uh, who are leading with IQ as well as EQ, emotional intelligence, uh, compassion, understanding that just refusing a flexible working request uh, for one person because it will open the floodgates to others seeking flexible working. Look to people as individuals, uh, lead in a human stroke humane way, like James Clary from Coots Bank. I'm going to give you this example because I think it paints the picture of what you can do uh, in your own careers, within your own spheres. Um, he was uh, quite high up at Coots Bank. And he decided one day to sit his 40 strong team down and give them each 10 minutes to tell him the rub in their day. What were the points that stressed them out? What were the points where they felt that they were feeling anxious or unable to be as productive as they possibly could? Um, he had that conversation and it was a two way conversation. It wasn't about an employee getting everything they need or an employer demanding 468 hours of unpaid overtime. It was a meeting of two minds. It was a relationship. And he sat them all down and then he implemented flexible working and he was communicating with his team and saying, so, you know, this person is going to work slightly different to this person. This person wants to pick up their child at 2.15. This person has a father with Alzheimer's and they need to get the train to go and make him a cottage pie on a Thursday night. He humanized his team. And when he was uh, asked to present to the board, um, why uh, productivity within his department had gone up 30%, why the rest of the bank were asking, well, can't we do what James's team was doing? He didn't lead with um, just wads of stats and figures, everything hidden in a little book for HR to wade through. He led with a photo of his secretary who had become engaged to, not disengaged from, her boyfriend. He led with a human story. He led with EQ, compassion, heart, uh, because so much comes back. Financially, the bottom line, they made more money. Um, and I think it's a good example of, yes, there need to be policies to an extent, but the minute you put a HR policy in place for flexible working, it immediately becomes inflexible. If you put EQ, empower your managers with uh, confidence that they can use their own understanding of their team to lead it effectively and not have blanket approaches for everyone and a fear of opening the floodgates, then and only then will you get the best out of your staff and you'll stop looking at where they're sitting and what they're doing. And uh, I think the second point before I finish up is um, we're really looking now to support the NHS. Um, and I think you can overcomplicate flexible working or agile working or uh, talent led uh, working, however you want to package it, but putting humans above business. And there's an example from Birmingham Women's Hospital. Uh, the matron sat her team of nurses down and just said, how would you like to work? What's important to you? Much like James Clary did in a very sort of white collar industry. Here we have a ward where it is a matter of life and death 
quite simply, how people work. And what they came through with, with the help of TimeWise, a uh, flexible working organization who are well worth looking into if you are looking to implement flexible working within your company. Uh, they came through with ward-led rostering, which meant that the nurses would uh, arrange amongst themselves how they covered shifts. So there wouldn't be any asking permission from the matron. They would simply sit down amongst themselves. She empowered them to work in a way that worked for them. And it would work in the sense of one nurse would say, well, it's my husband's birthday next Thursday. If <clears throat> you cover that, I'll cover you know, your child's nativity play. And they worked together. And there were fewer deaths on wards that were led in this way. And this is something we are working with, with Flex NHS, because there is a current recruitment crisis at the moment. And what happened there didn't cost a huge amount of money, much like Robert Reedbrook at PepsiCo, leaving loudly costs nothing. Leading with EQ costs nothing. Being human in business costs nothing. I think the important thing to know is that this is not a huge revolution. Uh, this is about evolution in a digital world that is willing and ready. Because look at us right now. I am talking to you from my office uh, and that has been facilitated through technology. I am zooming in and I'm logging on and I can still do my job. Uh, far from slacking, we've been using Slack for our advantage. And I think my final point is people say, what is the plan for Flex Appeal? We will continue driving this home. We will continue leading from the heart. And I will not stop until my two girls, who are very similar age to Jenny's two girls, two children, uh, until they don't face the same blockade that I did to my career, because I am not going to raise them to learn their ABCs, to learn their GCSEs, their A-levels, go on and work, to have a big open door shut in their face like I did. And I think my final point is that flexible working is not for uh, mummies who want to see more of their Weetabix matted children, as one guy on the Daily Mail had referred to me. Um, it's for people who are living with disabilities, uh, people with caring responsibilities, people simply wanting to live. Thank you so much for having me and uh, choose to challenge. And Liz Truss, I'll be following up uh, on your promises to normalize flexible working because uh, my girls are not gonna be raised for a fall. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anna. That was absolutely brilliant. Loads of things to pick up on um, and lots of um, thought provoking um, things that you raise in there. I think one of the things that really resonates with me is that that whole thing around mindset and that flexible working actually does not mean that you are a lesser employee. It does not mean you are less committed. And I think yeah. Sometimes that mindset is going to take a, a kind of a global and, and collective effort to try and really shift that mindset within employers, which is really interesting, really difficult. I've got a couple of questions on the side here, but I was going to start with one that had been submitted earlier just around teachers um, and that profession specifically because, you know, our kids go to school in, in defined times and just any thoughts or comments around how can we have a uh, think around uh, flexible working from the perspective of teachers and, and, and things around that. Yeah, well, I think, uh, first of all, any teachers listening or anyone who has friends who are struggling uh, in the teaching profession, and can we have a little moment for all the teachers right now? Like a big round of applause for, I think, any teacher that has navigated uh, Google Classroom and 30 children uh, accidentally unmuting themselves deserves uh, many an accolade. But I think there's two points here. One is, first of all, follow Return to Teach. Um, they have case studies, much like I was explaining uh, earlier about the top trumps cards we've given with our Flex Forever report, Return to Teach. They have a lot of examples of teachers making it work, how to empower head teachers to navigate uh, parental uh, concerns. And I think that's another point is I've heard from so many teachers who have said, it's not my uh, head teacher that's stunting me from working flexibly, it's the parents. 
-hmm. It's often parents who have flexibility themselves who are going, no, 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 I don't want two teachers for my child. And I'm like, EQ translates to all of us. It's not just managers, it's across the board. It's 360 degrees. Think of that teacher's career. Um, and that's where I think we come to job sharing, uh, being committed to making job sharing work. It does work. Uh, we've seen it with Lloyds Bank. You know, it's not the same sector, but you know, why would you not want to pair two brilliant minds together? Uh, my own dad, he said, why are we even calling it job sharing? It should be job pairing, pairing two brilliant people together. You're getting ultimately more bang for your buck, you know, on a very basic level. It's really breaking down the, the unconscious bias we have in terms of releasing people from this system that is ultimately stunting talent. Because you look at the dropout rate of teachers, why are you not looking to retain them? Uh, job sharing, you have two women, I, I hear constantly from teachers putting themselves forward and being rejected, try it. You know, you will have to communicate more with parents, with children, but, you know, break down those barriers because at some point it might be your daughter trying to drive through that. So those are my two points. Return to teach, use them to give some examples of how to do it. But secondly, if you are a parent, uh, think beyond your own needs in that and actually give job sharers a chance. You know, I think that's really interesting because you pick up on it through your talk around just general empathy. And actually, yeah. empathy can't just be about your own situation in your own workplace. If you are signed up to that idea of flexible working and empathy as an employer, that has consequences across every industry and, and activity. And, and teaching would be a really good example of one. And, and they have done an amazing job um, over the last uh, year and um, dealing with a huge array of, of challenges as they try and keep t uh, our children children kind of educated and engaged and, and still turning up. I'm going to turn to the chat now because we've got a great question in here around um, women who are stuck and, and I'm using the wording here stuck in, in a more basic job so st struggling with deprivation, food, clothing so it's not about that higher powered requiring talent it's just how can we help those women who are you know looking at, at you know it's, it's really around the more basic jobs how can flexible appeal work in that environment in that context? Yeah, it's a very good question. You know, this isn't, uh, I think, um, a, to be really frank, a lot of the kickback I've had is that I'm a painfully privileged woman uh, fighting to break down the nine to five. What about shift workers? But what about those on lower income, from lower income backgrounds? You know, um, and it's a, it's a very good point. And I think the point we have made alongside TimeWise, who I mentioned earlier, They've been uh, trialing um, flexible working within retail uh, environments. And also they obviously led the ward-led rostering at Birmingham Women's Hospital. And one of the things that came through was actually when you work shift, there is an element of flexibility in terms of being able to agree when work, when works for you to work. Not always, but what people wanted above all else was predictive flexible working. So we had um, a lot of people who were saying they were getting their shifts on a Sunday night and they were suddenly being expected to uh, manifest their whole childcare structure around that in a 24 hour period, which just isn't possible. And I think we also need to challenge the childcare sector that is very strapped to the nine to five model. Um, you know, I said earlier, I was charged a pound a minute after 6 p.m. What about somebody who's working for the NHS? What about somebody who's working on the floor at John Lewis? You know, it doesn't currently work for shift workers. So that is something uh, I think it's worth looking at TimeWise's um, website. They have case studies there that you can take to your employer about that predictive flex, um, empowering yourself to be able to just organize your week on a very basic level, uh, but making sure that you a zero hour contract are uh, protected as well. Um, but ultimately uh, the word empowerment goes across um, white collar businesses, Coots Bank, right the way through to uh, more public sector roles and lower income roles. Um, and yeah, it's something that needs to be pushed through. But I think uh, TimeWise is definitely the best place to go to find those case studies to empower your own organization. Okay, I'm gonna switch track here. And there's a question um, that's come in and it's reflective of the pandemic. And it's something that we've certainly been talking about um, with, I've been talking about my own friends and, and families. People are exhausted. Um, 
people moved to being um, online, as you say, incredibly quickly. It was like a switch and boom, you're, you're working from home. And while that happened really quickly, people are now transitioning into the mindset of, you know, will we go back to the office? What will go back? What will it look like? And there's also a nervousness around, oh, I'm not actually sure I want to go back to the office. How will that feel? So there's here, here, there's a risk that some people never want to return to the office and therefore will isolate themselves. And that makes it more difficult for those who have returned to the office. So it's just thinking about what do you think around that optimum balance around working from home, working in the office and, and how to navigate that as because some of it is I think connected to staff as staff's anxiety. I think uh, it's something that we found in the talk talk case study that I was talking earlier uh, about in the Flex Forever report. Um, like I said, I think uh, in my mind, flexible working utopia is where individuals are treated as individuals, uh, that we don't have these blanket approaches anymore, that you look at what people are doing and not where they're sitting. And actually, um, I think a lot of that comes from making it clear that there is a HQ for meetings. And I think you do need touch points in a, a week. The two uh, big misconceptions about what I do, I had a lot of people just saying, don't get rid of the nine to five. I love having boundaries because <laughs> overproductivity is something you need to look at right now. Stop looking at people doing too little working flexibly. That conversation is a thing of the past. Uh, it's overproductivity, people burning out, doing too much. Um, we looked at BP and they uh, implemented flexibility working in their team productivity went up 40 percent in three weeks but people burnt out so you know i think it's um about getting that balance and i think of people ebbing and flowing between uh, office and home but also for those with anxiety um lego have a really great uh, office structure in that they don't have people sitting within teams um, they have three floors one is uh, creative one is social and one is like a library so it goes from loud sort of conversational to quiet <laughs> And you can walk into the building and decide what you feel for that day, where you want to sit. And I think offices and managers and businesses right now can really think about how do you want your office to look? Do we want to strap people to their seats under a strip light um, and simply measure how long they're sitting at that seat? Or do we want to make people feel more comfortable, less anxious, work in a way that works for them and measure what they're doing? Um, it doesn't, I don't think it takes much, much thought to know which is the best uh, option there. And my final point is in our TED talk, uh, we drew the parallels between battery chickens and free range chickens. And if you actually look at the image of an office, and you compare it to battery hens, they are terrifyingly similar. So when, you know, Douglas Copeland was talking about the nine to five being barbaric, the optics on it alone, I think are worrying enough. And, you know, on a side note, the um, free range chickens lay bigger eggs. So uh, even they are more productive. <laughs> and I don't recommend taking a cardboard cut out of a chicken to a TED talk in Lucerne ever again, is all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Picking up on that bit around flexible working, there's a question here, and quite often it's women who opt to work flexibly. It's not necessarily yes. the men. And so how do we, so part of the transition is gonna be, it's about anyone and everyone considering options around flexible working, but how, do, and it comes back to that mind bit, mindset piece that we talked about earlier. How can we get more, more men engaged in wanting to work more flexibly? Well, on a very basic level, uh, the one in 10 flexible working requests go through for men, four in 10 goes through for women. So it's fact that the burden of childcare is strapped to female shoulders. It is assumed that women will adopt the role of caregiver, uh, even though there are uh, requests coming in from men. It's seen as emasculating. We need to just knock that on its head. Um, I had a comment a couple of years ago from a man who had put his 
uh, flexible working request in and it was denied um, and his boss said well you know can't you missus do that uh, talking about um, picking up their child from nursery and he said well you know she's a brain surgeon and on Tuesdays and Thursdays she kind of needs to um, be in surgery so you pick a lane he was in recruitment and it's not to say that you need to be a brain surgeon to be able to be afforded to a level of flexibility but we need to stop seeing this as um, a female issue uh, as such a maternal issue it's a talent issue uh, that is the bit that concerns me more than anything is all of these brilliant minds being rejected from the workforce for what for simply uh, daring to procreate so i guess sticking with that theme there's another question in the site in the box here around the balance of part-time working so often you find that employers will be more likely to facilitate flexibility if you're already an employee but part, if I reflect on my own experience, part of the reason I didn't leave the workforce, I like working, I, I enjoy my job, I get lots out of it, it helps my own identity. But I also felt that if I left, it was going to be really difficult to get back in at the level I felt that I could perform at. So there's something there about that transition. It's not just about your current existing employee pool, it's about potential and future employees. And, and are there words of advice you've got around how do we help employers think about actually advertising flexible job options? Yeah, 100%. Um, I think the fact that, you know, you have to be in a job for 26 weeks to be afforded uh, the opportunity to put your flexible working request in and then under you know nine times out of ten it's getting rejected uh just gives a sense of where we are that it's seen as something you need to earn it's a bonus ball it's equivalent to a ping pong table in reception it's a craft beer tap you know to get the the gen zers in um it's not it's a fundamental shift in the way we work in the very fabric of our working world a working world born in the industrial revolution and i think uh we to be quite frank for all of liz trust promises um i will hold her to those um i don't think things will change unless we change the law so it will change uh we will be asking for flex from day one for everyone to stop that stunting of talent to stop people feeling lucky to have a hint of flexible working you know we don't move we stay within our roles that talent isn't allowed to move and i think you know we need to really change the law so my point to managers is it's going to change. I promise you it will. By the time my kids are in the workforce, it will be part, it will be enshrined in law. So do you want to lead or do you want to be left behind? Uh, right now, employ people, make put flexible working up front, be clear on what you can do. If somebody comes in and says, well, you know, I can only work these hours, suggest to them, say, well, you know, there's somebody else uh, who, here who wants to do those hours, or can we link you up with somebody who could do a job share? Think creatively around employing individuals. Like Whitehall, for example, has a system internally. It's essentially a flexible working Tinder, where you can say, oh, I'm looking to do a job share within the company. Somebody else says, should we meet for lunch to discuss how we do it? They're facilitating facilitating a conversation that can ultimately mean they retain talent and that is all this about so uh, I think yeah is are you going to lead this the law will change I promise you that or are you going to be left behind and I think there's a really interesting thing about the next generation because I think they will come with a whole set of different yeah. expectations and actually they will gravitate to those employers that have done, who have changed and so if you want to retain talent it's not just about retaining your current talent it's about thinking about how do you want to be seen as an employer of choice in the future because those really talented people are going to gravitate there. There's a few questions on the side and it's and it's interesting and I reflect on my own journey. So sometimes um, employers don't want to know about your personal life and your circumstances and this is seen as a weakness. Um, but how do you kind of reposition this? And then there's something in here about I spend my life, I feel like I apologize all the time. My first day when I took this job, I finished work at quarter to, quarter to three on a Monday to pick up the kids from school. And my appointment as acting director was announced and it was Monday. And I'm like, really sorry you got this big meeting, but I'm going to have to go pick up my kids. And part of it, you have to leave because it's important, you, you know, you do that. But you, it's just how do you change that mindset of apologising and feeling that actually having a personal life is a weakness? 
It's a really, really good question uh, because I think it cripples us, to be honest, in our uh, careers is, uh, yeah, that apologetic nature of it's my fault, it's all on my shoulders. And um, it, it's, it's something that I think you need to look to your own children or grandchildren and think uh, this is for them, ultimately. You're owning the narrative for them um, because we are the generation where it's shifting. Uh, there is no doubt about it. We are in uh, transition and it's time to own the narrative. It's time to, for example, uh, in the way that we're all working now, I put on my um, in, on my emails an out of office uh, and I humanize it. I just say, I'm putting the kids to bed. Uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of like ear deep in Paw Patrol right now. Um, and, you know, there's, I said earlier about the leaving loudly policy. I like that because I think it's free. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't cost anything for a manager to simply say, let's stop with the putting your, you know, coat on the back of your chair and skulking out and pretending that, you know, you're going to come back. Let's lead with uh, owning our lives and being human in business. And I think this is what I have loved about seeing as restrictive as being in these little boxes is. You have seen people's children come in. You have seen people uh, spill food down them. I think one poor woman went to the toilet accidentally, uh, not realizing the whole of her team could see her, you know, on a very human level, you know, being trapped in these little Zoom boxes has allowed us to have a window into people who might have just seen that to be a good business leader is to be inhuman almost, to remove compassion, remove emotion, remove the core of actually what it is to be human in business and actually that has been broken down and I think so you need to do it for the generations that are going to come after you own it because if you own it you're opening the door you're opening the floodgates to others to do it those who might not feel confidence in doing it so we all need to link together choose to challenge <laughs> <laughs> bringing it back to the hashtag, <laughs> um, how we want our future to look. It was really interesting. We had a, a catch up recently with the team. And it, look, there's a lot of people on the team. And I was, if anyone had told me January would have involved like dark winter nights, homeschooling, new puppy, big jaw, I, you know, I would have opted out. And I, it was a real struggle. And, and I was having this, do I say to the team, you know, this is really hard and I'm struggling right now. Does that show that I'm weak or actually I am? really struggling right now and that's not weak that's just the reality that we're currently living in and so I ended up going I'm struggling and here are some things that I've done so I started joy board which it sounds really cheesy but it's like I had the best cinnamon bun yesterday that's joy so little things to make me feel a little bit better and just to remember this is temporary we will come out of this and, and, it, and it will um will improve and I'm just going don't think of it as a weakness because things are hard I've got a question in here around the kind of the digital access and it comes back to that. How do we make sure those who have less digital access are not further disadvantaged? You know, it's that digital divide um, that is really challenging right now and getting harder. Sorry, in terms of... Uh... So the question is here, I guess it's things around, you know, if people aren't able to access, so we've, we've been able to work from home and that in a way is... It, it's, it doesn't feel like a luxury, but it is a luxury. We've been able to pivot our jobs to working from home. So the question in the chat here is how can we try and I guess it's bridge those gaps so that um, those who maybe have less access to digital technologies, who are less able to access this kind of Zoom webinar, all these types of things that we're doing, how can we help maybe those, those individuals who feel outside of that um, that movement around um, that, that digital divide that has definitely been evident. We see it in schooling and um, kids who, you know, one phone between five and it, that type of thing that's really difficult. Yeah, I think sort of it's twofold really, just in terms of the talk talk example, they experienced that internally where, um, you know, those on the shop floor were seeing uh, those in the HQ being able to work from home, being able to work remotely, whereas they were still sort of strapped to the shop floor. But it does, I think, you know, there's an element of shift work versus kind of nine to five work. And I think that is going to have to be the next big focus. Um, and that comes down to uh, predictable shifts, 
um, understanding where the rub is in everybody's day, whether whichever side you work on, but also uh, what Talk Talk did was to communicate with their team and say, look, in terms of how you're working, you are already more flexible than those working in HQ, you know, but what we can do is give you your schedule, give you your timings two weeks in advance as opposed to two days in advance. Um, I think that's probably the best way to answer that. Okay. This one's, um, I guess this is a, a bit, look, this is um, somebody who's asking um, for a bit of advice here. Um, they've got a, a new baby um, who was born at 28 weeks. Um, and this is their third month in the neonatal unit. And they're now, um, she's got to call their employer to ask um, about additional leave. And she's, she's just nervous around asking for more flexibility. She's done some research and has support from a charity uh, called The Smallest Things. Um, but she's just wondering if there's any good e if employers that you know of or any suggestions around how you encourage the employer to think sympathetically on this request. I think that you can lead almost with uh, what's good for business. Um, you know, I think while obviously we're encouraging a more humane, compassionate uh, world of work, that doesn't mean you can't put the business at the heart of everything that you do, you know, in the way that we hope the employer puts you at the heart of what they do, uh, that relationship again. And I think you can lead with two points, really. Um, I think really lead with the bare business facts, retaining talent. You know, I think any employer that is not going to listen to a mother who has a premature baby and is asking for uh, some extra time to navigate that, that's not flexible working, that's compassionate leave. I think they're very separate. Um, so it's not asking for flexibility, you're asking for compassionate leave. And I think you need to make that very clear, the definition on that, but that actually your intention is to return yeah. you know it might not be if to be honest if, if they respond and say absolutely not then i think i would genuinely question the employer that i'm working for and that doesn't necessarily help i realize in terms of the financial side of things but um yeah i think it is uh really looking to the business side of it but please can i have this as compassionate leave Thanks, Anna. I'm conscious of time. I could talk to you forever. This is just, I'm loving this. It's brilliant. Um, but I'm going to pull in, I've got two other questions here I'm going to try and pull in. So um, this is one, I've got a 13 year old daughter who believes passionately in equality and women's rights. How do I channel that passion in a way that makes her feel that her voice is being heard? So um, funny enough, I've had a uh, very similar chats with my kids because they often just go, "What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> what is all this?" Yeah. Um, and I think we always forget that they're uh, small; they're sort of adults trapped in small bodies. And I have spoken to my daughters about everything from sort of the gender pay gap, which they just basically fell asleep in, uh, to uh, miscarriage because um, they were aware that I was pregnant and then I wasn't. And I wanted to, for them to understand everything that was going on. And um, I think the biggest point that I've made to my daughters is that um, you don't need to be the loudest to be heard. I think there's a misconception that you need to shout the loudest, be the most bullish, you know, man up. Um, you don't have to, you know, you can be heard. Uh, and my way of being heard when I was in a particularly bullish meeting, I've been in some quite significant round tables uh, with quite, you know, gargantuan egos um, and uh, in Whitehall specifically. And I've often sat there, you know, in a uh, rainbow colored jumpsuit wondering what am I doing here uh, feeling complete imposter syndrome every step of the way and I fast realized I'm not going to be heard if I try and be someone else yeah. I've got to be myself and I've got to be heard my points have to come from here not over there and one thing that was very useful for me and I've passed to my daughters and hopefully you can pass to your 13 year old is um, when you're in a meeting and somebody's really bullish uh, and shouting the loudest is put a placeholder in that in that conversation so interrupt them gently mid-flow 
So then they know to come to you next. So you don't need to directly stop them in their tracks, but just put a placeholder. They then come to you, you're ready to go. And, you know, I have found I've been heard so much better in meetings than just shouting the loudest uh, because that's what everyone else is doing. Uh, I, I'm not interested in manning up and interested in probably manning down, um, but it's each to their own. So find your voice, find what feels comfortable for you, but do not look to other people and go, right, I'm going to do it that way. Look to yourself and your mum. I think that is great advice. I think that whole <laughs> thing about how do you how do you develop your credibility in the room, and actually yeah. shouting louder often is counter it's counterproductive. Um, and being... we were in um, my when my daughter and I took her to Parliament uh, quickly, and she just looked around at everyone. She said, "Why is everyone else wearing a grey suit? Why you know I was in some colourful outfit." I said. I don't know. I don't know why everyone just keeps following this like, pencil skirt, serious shirt. I'm like, it doesn't diminish, how you look doesn't diminish what you have to say. Um, so just, yeah, it's easy to say. And it sounds like something to be stitched on a cushion and sold for International Women's Day. But, you know, be, be yourself. But the more people that take the confidence and do that, then the less people you'll have in grey suits. It will start to change. And I've got one last question that I'm going to fi finish on here that says, what is the one thing that we could all do now to encourage flexible working? So the one thing you can all do now is to send the Working Forward pledge uh, from the Equality and Human Rights Commission to your employer, to your HR manager. Because on a very basic level, there are lots of companies that have signed up to it to commit to changing the workplace for everyone, uh, to put equality at the heart of employment. And you'll see Ford has signed up, Pets at Home has signed up. There are lots and lots of different companies that have signed up, but it's a starting point and it's a conversation starter at the very least with companies that are resistant to change. And also at this point, before we finish, companies that are using the pandemic to measure productivity and going, no, it, it won't work, so we can't continue. This is where you need to be able to push back. And I think, um, yeah, you, you have a voice. Your voice is essential. This is not for government to simply fix. This is not for lobbyists to fix. This is for us to fix together uh, with our 13 year old daughters holding their hands and changing the future for them so that they don't have to come to a point where uh, their careers are being shut down by somebody who's quite simply forgotten where they came from. <laughs> And I have to say a massive thank you. I have thoroughly enjoyed the last hour. It's been brilliant. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts and, and talk around some of the issues that we've touched on today. And we've had huge engagement in the, from the audience. So a massive thank you. Happy International Women's Day. Delighted you've been able to, to join us. Um, and so with that, to everyone else, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. We hope you found it helpful. But do, as the, as the, the theme is this year, do choose to challenge because by all of us, collectively and individually challenging I think we can you know that is how change will happen so Anna thank you enjoy the thanks, rest of the day. and thanks everyone for listening um and if you want to follow our work our flex forever report is at mother uh under flex um thank you so much brilliant thanks Anna bye